We appreciate so much the Bells of the Hills bringing us into our worship time today. Welcome. Good to see you this morning on this second Sunday of Easter. We're so glad you're here to worship with us. And we welcome you in this, the first of our three on-campus worship services today, as well as those who are joining us online. We're so glad you're worshiping with us. We have several guests here in the sanctuary with us, and we want to extend a special welcome to you. We're so glad you've chosen to worship with us today. Uh, we hope everyone, guests and members alike, will take a moment, you may have already, to register your attendance there on that connection pad. Pass that down so that we can have a record of your being with us. And if you're a first-time guest especially, please give us a way to say thank you for worshiping with us today. Someone sat out in the hallway and said, you look especially exuberant today. And I wonder why. Uh, that's because, of course, uh, the long COVID delay for our trips to Israel. I've been going to Israel every other year now for 25 years. And uh, that long delay is coming to an end tomorrow morning, heading over there for the 15th time with uh, 42 pilgrims, and we are very excited about that. Some of you here, we're very excited about heading over there and experiencing the land again. All right, let's see. We've got a week ahead that's very busy. Let me talk about Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. On Tuesday night, we have the PEO Singers and the Hot Spring Village Men's Chorus right here uh, at church at 7.30 p.m. No ticket required, so come and enjoy an evening of music in the swing, okay? Wednesday night, 5 o'clock, our midweek manna is picking up again. That's a great midweek time for devotional, singing, uh, and Holy Communion. So at 5 o'clock on Wednesday night. And then on Thursday, a special announcement for you singles. You see that on the front page of the Weekly Ringer that we're calling All Christ of the Hills Singles. There's, uh, after the, the COVID pause now, uh, for the first time they're coming back together this Thursday at 11.30, and that will be a potluck. There's a registration, a form out there in the Welcome Center uh, so they can uh, have a good record of your being, uh, being here and what you're bringing and so forth. So that's coming up on Thursday. And boy, a full page about the uh, United Methodist Women's Garage and Bake Sale, so please take notice of that. That's a major event, obviously, at Christ of the Hills. That's coming up in mid-May, so just a couple of weeks away now. And this sheet will tell you what you can do to make this an even more successful time. All right, we're going to begin our worship with a call to worship and our opening hymn. I want to warn you before we even stand that we're going to do a different affirmation now that you won't have memorized like you do the Apostles' Creed. So keep that hymnal in your hand and you'll be turning after our song to number 885 for a modern affirmation. But now let us stand for our responsive call to worship from the 149th Psalm. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. Let us praise his name with dancing. Making melody to him with tambourine and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adores the humble with victory. And our opening hymn is Easter People. Raise your voices, number 304. Death can no more stop us from our 
A modern affirmation is found at 885. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. You may be seated. Our joys and concerns can be found on the back of your bulletin. And if you have others that you would like for us to lift up, please let us know. We do have prayer cards in our pews. And so you can fill one of those out and put it back in the offering plate or hand it to one of the ushers. And we would be glad to lift up your concerns and your joys as well. Our traditional service altar flowers are given to the glory of God by Charlotte Skelton in memory of her husband, Jack Skelton. Our welcome center flowers are given to the glory of God by Wally and Sally Duco in celebration of their seventh wedding anniversary. We want to extend our sympathy to Don Atchley on the death of his brother, Joe Atchley. You see other concerns listed there. I want to add um, Nell Rivers is still in the hospital. And then also over the weekend, Sally Crawford was put in the hospital and Martha Sweeney. So we want to continue to remember them in our prayers as well. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Holy Lord, once again, we give you thanks for a time when we can come together as your brothers and sisters. We pray that as we hear your word, we will experience your peace within our hearts and within our lives as we share in fellowship with one another. We're thankful to have this opportunity every week to come to you and to share our prayers with you. But we know that we can come to you anytime, any day, to offer up our concerns and also celebrate our joys. And we thank you for listening and responding to our concerns. We ask you to be with our loved ones that we've lifted to you today for their needs, whether they are grieving or recovering from illness or surgery, whether they just need a friendly smile or conversation. We ask that you be with them and comfort them. We ask that you guide us to do all that we can to help them as well. Lord Jesus, we know that you appeared to your disciples and shared your peace with them. And we know that we can have that same peace in our hearts and in our lives. We ask for your peace to be with us, and we pray that we can give that peace to others. No matter what any of us are going through, your peace will be with us, encouraging us, supporting us, giving us all that we need each and every day. We thank you for your peace. We need it, especially in the chaos of our world and we pray that it spreads throughout our world. Continue to be with us as we worship, as we work, and as we are in ministry together. We lift up our prayers to you, our Lord and Savior. Amen. <coughs> I feel 
Y'all, two Methodists. Because I know I saw your faces. I saw you getting down with that. <laughs> and amen just doesn't quite cut it, does it? I was hoping y'all sit there and go, yeah! <laughs> y'all just need to let go. Because yeah. amen. Amen. Easter was already here and every day not every Sunday every day is Easter because God is alive amen Amen. Amen. thank you choir Mm, yes man I wish I had something like this before I preached we passed the snakes in the gathering I know that The scripture passage comes out of the gospel of John, the 20th chapter, verses 19 through 29. In honor of the gospel, would you rise as you are able and continue to stand for our chorus afterwards. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. 
If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails with my hand on his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Jesus answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. The word of God for the children of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. I always look forward to this time of year with the choir. I look forward to every Sunday, every Sunday with the choir, but particularly the last four or five, because the choir votes in April for their top ten favorite anthems that we've done during the course of that year, and we present those through the month of, of May. Since there was a tie, we did one early. Is that okay? That, that one that we just did tied for second place. So... It's going to be a great May as we'll present these songs. The favorite, the favorite one will be done the third Sunday in May, and you'll have to try to guess which one that one is. You look like you don't really care. <laughs> she said they're all good. Thank you. Bless you. Yes, they are. They are. I am thankful for our choir. Don't they mean a lot? Amen. They really Amen. do. Thank you. Let's bow for our offertory prayer. Heavenly Father and our loving, generous God, we humbly come before you this morning during this offering time. Lord, we don't give our tithes and offerings this morning because you make us. We don't give because anyone else is watching. We give because we are grateful and because we want to be a part of the work of your kingdom in every way we possibly can. And so, Lord, we ask this offering be placed in your hands and we trust that you will do a mighty and miraculous work because we give believing in the power of your holy word to make a difference and to reach a hurting world needing the message of your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Amen. Please remain standing and take out your hymnals. Turn with me, if you will, to hymn number 500. Hymn number 500. We're going to sing the first, second, third, and last stanzas. We'll omit the fourth stanza. Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. 500. <coughs> be seated. You'll see in the order of worship then that from John chapter 20, the passage that Steve just read, I've taken just a few pieces of verses. First, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Shalom, which is peace, be with you. And then that, uh, that's from 19. From verse 21, Jesus said to them again, Shalom, peace be with you. And then a week later in verse 26, Jesus came and said, Shalom, peace be with you. So today the three Shaloms of Jesus. You see in that top image there, uh, Shalom Aleichem. Uh, the top line is Hebrew. It's read from right to left, Shalom Aleichem. The middle line is, of course, a transliteration, Shalom Aleichem. And then the bottom line is the translation into English, Peace be upon you. And each of these three Shaloms was the full Shalom Aleichem. So John, in his post-resurrection narrative of chapter 20, puts these familiar words, even today a familiar greeting. Our pilgrims are going to hear this a lot, Shalom Aleichem, even today. And uh, these words are put on Jesus' lips three times in this post-resurrection narrative. Those three Shaloms of Jesus, who we welcomed into Jerusalem two weeks ago as the Son of David. Remember, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Remember? 
Jesus came to fulfill God's promise to David, King David, in Psalm 89, when God said, I will establish your throne forever. As long as the sun and moon endure, I will not lie unto David. So the truth of that promise is residing in Jesus. The fulfillment of that promise of the Davidic dynasty continuing forever is fulfilled in Jesus. Those three shaloms of Jesus inspired the three shaloms that that I put on the lips of King David as he passed away in, in my recent book, Dancing with David. I was imagining his final words, his last and lost uh, psalm, a prophecy, his dying prophecy. And I've given you here in the bulletin just the last few words of David's last prophecy. Praise be to God, the rock of my salvation, shalom, shalom, shalom. Three shaloms. And then the comment of Stella Maris, my main character. I don't know how many times David repeated shalom. It was a holy moment watching him draw his last breath trying one last time to form the word shalom, yet with no air in his lungs to make another sound. My intent was to form a connection between King David and the one we call David's greater son, Jesus, so that as King David died with shalom upon his lips, the son of David, the greater than David, rose from the dead with that same shalom upon his lips, as the Gospel of John tells us. I thought of it when I was writing it like a relay race, as if King David was on one leg of the journey, and he was getting to the end of his leg, and he was losing his, his breath. That breath was leaving him, but as he handed it off to Jesus, that breath in Jesus' resurrection uh, came to life, stirred again with these three shaloms. Now, it seems to me that we can describe these three shaloms of Jesus as peace, which is the primary meaning of the word shalom, but also of power. For Jesus said as He did this, as the Father sent me, so I send you. And then He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So this was an empowering. This is what we're going to experience Uh, after the 50 days of Easter on Pentecost Sunday. It's God's breathing upon the church with this mighty wind from heaven that stirs the church and empowers it and releases it into the world. And then finally, as highlighted in the story of St. Thomas, a third shalom demonstrating proof. So you have peace and power and proof in these three shaloms of Jesus. Our reading certainly is one of the most familiar of the post-resurrection narratives in the Gospels. The story of the one disciple, Thomas, who had been absent from the room when Jesus first appeared on Easter night. Thomas required more evidence, right, of the resurrected Jesus, and and he received that wished-for evidence the following week, which prompted Jesus to say, you have believed because you have seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. I've given you in that second image one of the most famous of Caravaggio's paintings. It's called The Incredulity of St. Thomas, a work of the great Italian Baroque artist from uh, 1601, and it now resides in Germany. It hauntingly shows the surprise on Thomas's face as Jesus holds his hand and guides it into the wound in his side, just as Thomas had requested. If you're an art lover, by the way, and I'm not going to go into the story of this great painting, but if you're an art lover, there are some wonderful YouTube videos online. I encourage you to call it up. Just Google uh, The Incredulity of St. Thomas by Caravaggio, and you'll see the story that's behind this amazing painting. But I want us to maintain our focus this morning on the three times in our reading where Jesus offers the common Hebrew greeting, Shalom Aleichem, peace be with you. 
on Easter evening, the disciples are in lockdown mode, right? We know something about lockdowns in our day of pandemic. And who could blame them for their security consciousness? It was an entirely reasonable fear that the authorities in Jerusalem might attempt to purge any pockets of resistance, that there might have been any uh, remnant of influence that this Jesus, the troublemaker who had just been crucified, uh, might have left in Jerusalem. They wanted to get rid of it. And so the disciples, realizing that might be the reflex of the authorities in Jerusalem, locked themselves down. It is in this lockdown setting that we have the first appearance of Jesus. No sound of knocking at the door, none of that. John just simply says he appeared among them. And he greeted them with this common salutation, Shalom Aleichem. So Jesus is speaking shalom, peace to the disciples' fear that was gripping them. And he doesn't stop there, but he then commissions them and gives them purpose and then power to fulfill that purpose as he says, as I send you, or as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And then with another shalom alechem, he breathes upon them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. This is why, by the way, a couple of the hymns, you might have thought I got confused in the calendar, uh, that, that we were already at Pentecost Sunday. After the reading of our text, we sang, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. And then this hymn right before the message, Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. I could hear some of you out there thinking, does the pastor think it's Pentecost or something? No, but this is, this is a mini Pentecost as Jesus breathes upon the disciples, and uh, just as God breathed upon His church in Pentecost to send us forth into the world. This is why I wanted in Dancing with David to highlight the king's last breath, no air left to form another shalom. But now, now in Jesus, David's greater son, power in the renewed breath of God through Jesus Christ. So here we have it, shalom alechem times three. If Peter had denied him three times, Jesus now answers those three denials with three shaloms, speaking peace to the grief and pain and embarrassment of Peter. Jesus' shalom alechem is a burst of holy energy that opens the door of opportunity which had been until now locked. Now the risen Christ, proven to His disciples, as we see in that beautiful painting of Caravaggio, now this risen Christ would become the source of peace and power as the church went forth in its ministry, emerging from the lockdown of the upper room, a lockdown of disappointment and fear and confusion, and marching that banner of the risen Christ through lands of the earth and through the times, through the centuries, and now millennia, until that banner of the risen Christ comes right into the doors of this sanctuary in Hot Springs Village, Arkansas, and wherever else in the world today, on the first day, we are worshiping the risen Lord. We brought that light in as a reflex of the light that Jesus brought into the upper room that day. This is the continuing energy of the church, the light of Christ. Real Life Adventures is a comic strip. It was syndicated in 1991. It's drawn by Gary Wise and Lance Aldrich. I cut out one years ago, I bet 20 years ago, where a man is holding a key and he's staring at it with a very puzzled look. And the caption underneath reads this, no matter how sure you are that it doesn't fit anything anymore, you're never sure enough to throw it away. Now, if you ask me, that's a real-life adventure. I suspect most of us have been there. I can tell from your response that you have. I know I have. Most people possess an undeniable reluctance to tossing out old keys. I became acutely, I told you this story many years ago, but I became acutely aware of my old key phobia in 1985 when I was hired as a young 31-year-old 
administrative assistant at one of Michigan's most historic churches, First United Methodist Church in Ann Arbor, right off of the campus of the university. And they had a veritable mountain of old keys in that historic church, and it was getting out of hand. And one of the very first tasks that was assigned to me by the staff parish uh, uh, director, the, the chair of the staff parish committee, was to uh, accomplished key control, he called it. I want some key control. So he commissioned me. He didn't breathe on me, but he empowered me to do whatever I wanted to do with those, with those keys, to purge our office of those out-of-use keys. And what a pile it was. Old keys to outside entrances, office doors, filing cabinets, storage areas, display cabinets, padlock, old church vehicles, no doubt, and more. Clean it up, Mr. Administrator. Be bold. Be bold. Implement operation key control and discard all of these old keys. Now, confession time. I applied a Band-Aid to the problem. I made an honest effort to identify each key and I implemented a better system of organization of the clearly active keys. No major surgery, though, would I attempt. Truth be told, many of the old keys I just reshuffled into different hiding places. They're probably still finding them. Were I to start to throw away a key, I would stare at it like that vacillating fellow in the cartoon, pondering my choices with an internal dialogue. If I held it toward disposing it, there was like an invisible force field resisting my advance, compelling me to ask, I wonder, I wonder if this key maybe, just maybe fits something I haven't, th some door, some lock that I haven't thought of yet that next week I'm going to need entrance into that place. The rational part of me cried out, no way does this key fit anything. Goodness, these offices have been rekeyed a dozen times since this key was probably used. It must be a hundred years old. Surely nothing would be hurt by throwing that key away. And again, I would start to toss it, but my fingers wouldn't release it. It was like Gorilla Glue was on my finger. It just would not go. So despite my best intentions, the key and me would not separate. So in a just-in-case rationalization, I kind of sort of slipped that key into a hiding place, way, way back in my desk drawer. The moral of the story is this. There is a wonderful sense of security in our keeping of old keys. And there's no mystery of psychology here. Old keys offer a calming link with our past, and they accentuate our instinctive fear of change. One of the most challenging parts, but also a blessed part of the vocational life of a pastor is the sacred act of listening. And pastors come to recognize that of all the various emotions with which members of their congregation might be struggling and come to talk and, and pray with the pastor about, one thing lies at the root of many of those problems, and that is that we're all on a journey, and the journey implies changes. Changes are happening in our life all the time, you know. Stability is a wonderful word. We seek it. We crave it. We want stability, but we all know it's temporary, as our temporary home that our choir sang. The pastor's task, it seems to me, is so often to find a way to speak shalom to those in the midst of life changes. A way to speak peace and renewed purpose and even power to those who are enduring changes in life. Divorce, broken health, the loss of a loved one, a child struggling with addiction, the list goes on and on. How does one speak shalom? How does one speak peace in these moments? These things, and honestly sometimes irrational fear of these things, can put us in lockdown mode, spiritually, emotionally, 
just lock us in. This is in reality an attempt to foster stability. I, I refuse to change, and that stability can be an illusion. So the pastoral question so often is, how do we speak shalom to those who are in lockdown mode as Jesus spoke shalom to His disciples behind those locked doors for fear? How indeed do we speak peace in a way that leads to renewed purpose and power to live joyfully? Now to introduce a paradox, even even when our situation leaves us crying for change, we still can fear the change that we so much desire. And the story of the book of Exodus is, of course, the greatest biblical example probably of this, that God handed to the Hebrews after 400 years in Egyptian bondage, God handed to the Hebrews a key to the promised land. They set out with Moses on that journey. And at first, everything's going well. But at the sea, when they faced the Red Sea, the old key phobia set in. As Pharaoh hemmed them in, the Israelites looked back. I'm quoting now from Exodus. And in great fear, they cried out to the Lord. They began to crave, you see, the old keys to the old places so they complained to Moses with these words what have you done to us bringing us out of Egypt is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt let us alone and let us serve the Egyptians it's as if they're saying Moses you've given us a new key to the promised land you ask us to turn in all the old keys and it sounds wonderful but can't we hold on to these old keys for just a little while longer you know, they had onions back there. They had food. It may have been unmitigated misery back in Egypt, but at least it was our unmitigated misery. Something to call our own. Out here we're exposed. We don't know for sure what awaits us tomorrow or the next day or the next day. We want to access our old room, however threadbare its furnishings were. We want to be able to be where we were. Lockdown is not, after all, such a bad idea. That's basically what they were saying to Moses. Why is it so hard to toss the old keys to the old places, even to old places of misery? Here is the psychological curveball seen in those struggling to find a doorway to, of escape outside of, say, abusive relationships or even addictions. You know, the words go forward. Here's the new key. Go forward. That's not always a welcome message to those who feel trapped. 2,000 years ago, a band of Galilean disciples walked out of the locked doors of an upper room in Jerusalem. They would need the key to that room no longer. They were ready to toss it. Why? Because Jesus had come and with three shaloms, He spoke peace, purpose, power. And He gave them the proof that they needed to go forth into the world. And the same keys symbolized by the light that we bring into this sanctuary every time we come to worship. The same keys are in our hands, my hand, your hand, our church's hand today to go forth into the world in the name of Jesus Christ and speak shalom and peace to a troubled world. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, no more Pentecost hymns. We're back to majesty now, and we're going to rejoice that the Lord is King. If there are those today desiring to unite with Christ of the Hills, United Methodist Church, as always at the end of our worship, this uh, chancel is open for you, and always we encourage those. We had some join last week uh, who will be making that public in the gathering service here in just a little bit. And always we encourage you to contact our pastors to come and talk to us or we'll come to you and talk to you about what it means to be a part of Christ of the Hills United Methodist Church. Number 715, let's stand and sing.
Jesus, the Savior, reigns, the God of truth and love. When he had purged our sins, he took his seat above. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice Thank you for joining us in worship today. We have our coffee and cookie time in our fellowship hall. We hope you'll join us there. If you're a guest, please know, please come and join us, and, and we'd love to welcome you yet more to Christ of the Hills this morning. Would you now receive this benediction? And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you now and always. Amen. Let us join hands as you are comfortable and sing the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Deliver us. 